It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Um, if you have an Ellen White study Bible, the people that put it together when they're dealing with that particular section in, in uh, that we just read, they apply that to the most holy place. Is that how you would understand that? Coming into the holiest? If, if that's how you understand it, say amen. Because then, then this is a passage that's dealing with history um, that takes place after October 22nd, 1844, correct? Okay, this isn't something, this isn't a, no one moved into the most holy place before that time. Okay, so let's just keep that in our mind. You'll see why, Lord willing, as we progress. For those of you that um, weren't here last night, um, we began by briefly considering the principle that Sister White specifically says that every reform movement parallels other reform movements. There's a couple chairs up here too. Um, and she, in that statement from Great Controversy, she says God's dealings with men is ever the same. So we have taken um, a look at the different reform movements in biblical history and found that they all possess the same characteristics, the same way marks. And this is a, uh, a simplified breakdown of every reform movement, whether it's Noah, Elijah, Moses, Cyrus, John the Baptist, the Millerites. They all begin with the time of the end, which is the fulfillment of a prophecy that opens up new prophetic light for this generation. After the prophetic light is opened up, then the message that's going to test that generation is formalized. Um, Noah is the one that the Lord used to formalize it in his history, Elijah in his, Moses in his, John the Baptist, William Miller. The, the Lord identifies a human being that puts the increase of knowledge into an understandable presentation so that this generation can be tested by it. The Lord's not going to hold us accountable for something that is impossible to understand is that message is formalized and goes through history it comes a point in time when it's empowered and these reform lines mark for us that they it, it is these messages this message is empowered when a divine symbol comes down um, with Moses um, the Lord came down and confronted him with circumcision um, in the history of Christ, at his baptism, the dove came down. In the history of the three decrees, as Cyrus was backsliding on his understanding to allow the Jews to go back to Babylon, in Daniel chapter 10, we're told that Michael came down. Um, in the Millerite history, on August 11, 1840, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down and empowered the Millerite movement. Um, all of these histories are pointing forward to the history at the end of the world when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins with the third angel's message and, and empowers it. All these reform lines are prefiguring the history of the 144,000, the history of the latter reign, and uh, that's why we're looking at these waymarks. We find that in, in this first waymark, in the Millerite history, this is easiest for us to conceptualize as Adventists probably by saying this is the first angel's message, this is the second angel's message, this is the third angel's message when they arrived in history. Uh, okay. Um, what I did say last night, and it's on tape so you can see this, is I have left many of the characteristics out of this presentation because I, we're not we're not doing this presentation in detail and one of the th one of the let me finish where I was at and I'll go back and add that on we never meant mentioned the three steps of the Holy Spirit at all last night in the in the history of the first way mark with the Millerites after the first angels message is being fulfilled, you will found, find that the foundations are already always established in this history. William Miller was used to establish the foundations of Adventism, and we reread many quotes last night 
that identified that the foundation foundational message of Adventism was the message that is represented on these two charts over here. If you were here last night and you heard more than five quotes that said the message from 1840 to 1844 is the message, the foundational message and the message that we're, we were to teach. If you were here last night and heard those quotes, say amen. amen. For those of you that didn't hear it last night, it's in your syllabus, those quotes. And so you know that, that the foundational message of Adventism is the message that's on the 1843 chart on the left and then on the 1850 chart on the right. Um, in the history of the three decrees, the foundation of the temple was laid in the history of the first decree. Um, we went through last night that John the Baptist, in this history, put, identified the foundational message for his time period. Uh, Moses, in his history, presented the Sabbath reform at the beginning. The message of that time was that the Lord was going to take his people out of Egypt that they might worship. The Sabbath is the foundation of true, true worship. So in each of these histories, the foundation is, is put here. And then you'll see the activities of the enemies. The, the Protestant churches close their door upon the Millerites. Second angel's message arrives. History of Christ. Sanhedrin chooses that Christ should die rather than the whole nation perish. History of Moses. Uh, Pharaoh says you're going to keep the number of bricks you're producing and you're going to go gather your own straw now. You'll always see an activity of the enemies connected in this history. Then the second angel's message as the first message. First message goes through history for a period of time and and then it's empowered. The second message begins in June of 1842. That's Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21. And it's empowered at the midnight cry. These messages go through history, and then at some point, later point in time, they're empowered. Um, the midnight cry, this is the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem in the history of Christ. This is the, the plagues of Egypt. And then the third way, Mark, when the third angel's message arrives, October 22nd, 1844, judgment begins. And you see judgment illustrated at this way mark. Judgment of the cross. The judgment of the firstborn in, at Passover in the story of Moses. Uh, you find that the, this way mark is followed by a disappointment. The disappointment of the Hebrews with the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them, which Sister White compares to the disappointment of the Millerites on October 23rd, 1844. The disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross. The disappointment of Noah when he was put in the ark here, when the world was judged, and he was expecting the rain to come, but it didn't come. It took seven days before the rain came. You, saw, you see a disappointment illustrated here. Then a work is given to the people of God to do, and ultimately they quit doing the work. And so what? when you look closely at this, this is much much hotter than it was yesterday. Maybe that's better. Maybe it's out of my breath. Okay. The, this, the, every reform movement is governed, controlled, and guided by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible teaches us that the, the Holy Spirit um, confronts us with three things. Convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And this first message you'll find is a reform message, whether it's John the Baptist, William Miller, Moses, Noah, Elijah. The first message, the characteristic, is a reform message. It's a conviction of sin. William Miller's message convicted the people of his generation that you either deal with the sin in your life or you're going to be lost because the Lord's about to return. And the first work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. The second is of righteousness. And it's in this time period when righteousness is manifested. In the midnight cry, the righteousness of Christ was manifested in the, the Millerites of that time period. Um, the righteousness, of, righteousness is manifested in this, where the Holy Spirit is manifested in this history. And then the third work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin and uh, uh, no, convict of judgment to come. And you'll see in this way, Mark, the judgment is always illustrated. So when you understand that the Bible teaches that the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come, and you understand the characteristics of these three way marks in every reform movement, then you'll see that every re the, the characteristics of every reform movement is built upon the step-by-step -step work of the Holy Spirit every time. So um, 
there is much more to be said about that. This is this was simply a brief overview, and it, from, then after we went through that brief overview yesterday, then we went into the seven thunders of Revelation 10, and demonstrated that sef the seven thunders were sealed up. They were the only thing that were sealed up in Revelation. Um, and we identified that at different points in history, God's truth are sealed up. Sister White deals with that. The book of Daniel was sealed up until the time of the end. And Sister White tells us that the reason, the, the way that truth is sealed up is through the reception and customs of traditions of men that are handed down from generation to generation. And we find that in each of these reform movements at the beginning, there's a prophecy that's unsealed. And in, in Revelation 4 and 5, we see Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah as the one is, that is given the privilege of unsealing the book that's sealed with seven seals, which we identified from a Spirit of Prophecy quote, is the Bible. And uh, so at the beginning of each of these reform movements, there's going to be a prophecy that's unsealed that, that, that presents a message that will test this generation and in Revelation 10 verse 4, the seven thunders are sealed up. But in Revelation 22, 10 and 11, Revelation 22, 11 is identifying the close of probation where it says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. But in verse 10, the verse right before the close of probation, it says, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And the only prophecy in Revelation that is sealed up is the seven thunders. So just before probation closes, whatever the seven thunders represent is unsealed for God's people. And Sister White tells us the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that transpired under the first and second angel's message. In other words, the seven thunders represent the history of 1798 when the first angel's message arrives until 1844 when the third angel's message arrives. The seven thunders represents the history of 1798 to 1844 and that history was sealed up. You know, I can show you right now how that history was sealed up. It, I want everyone to participate if you would. We, there's no points against you if, if, if you answer right or wrong on this. But how many of you are prepared right now to go out this afternoon and give a Bible study to a non-Adventist on the 25-20 time prophecy? Raise your hands high. Now, oh, let's, let, this would be a better illustration. How many of you are not prepared to do so? Okay, see, but you see the 25-20 is represented on both those charts. And that chart on the left, the 1843 chart, it was used by every single Millerite preacher exclusively. The Millerites all knew what the 2520 was. They taught it. And that history, which is this history here, it's been sealed up. We don't even know what it is any lo longer. You know, there's people have been following this message that are in this room, so they're familiar. But typically, if you go to an Adventist congregation for the first time, and you ask that question. I've been in places that have more people than this and not one hand goes up when you ask, are you ready to give a Bible study on the 2520? It's been sealed up to our understanding that not just the 2520, but this history that's represented by the seven thunders. The seven thunders, Sister White says, represents a delineation of events that took place between 1798 and 1844. But she also says the seven thunders relate to future events that will be disclosed in their order. So what w the point we were making last night, to try to simplify this down, is that at the beginning of the Millerite history, which is going to be repeated to the very letter in the history of the 144,000, and we gave many proofs of that yesterday. At the beginning of the Millerite history, the book of Daniel was unsealed and there was an increase of knowledge that tested the Millerite generation. If that history is to be repeated, and it is, the prophecy that is unsealed for us here at the end of the world isn't the book of Daniel, it's the seven thunders. Okay, and, and the seven thunders is, is the principle that the Millerite history is repeated in our day and age. And so, um, that's probably enough to lead into this presentation on page 23. Now we're going to <coughs> get more specific about the Millerite history. This is this is going to be the pretty much the same line that's up there, <coughs> but we're going to put the dates on it and give you the the proof text so that you see that it's not just my interpretation. The time of the end for the Millerites was 17, 
98. You will see a quote from the Great Controversy, page 356 there, the top of page 23. And if you read it closely, you will see that Sister White is marking the time of the end as 1798. And at the time of the end, according to Daniel chapter 12, the book of Daniel would be unsealed. Um, the second quote there, Sermons and Talks, volume 1, page 225. Daniel has been standing in his lot. The seal remo was removed and the light of truth has been shining upon his vision. He stands in his lot bearing the testimonies which was to be the testimony which was to be understood at the end of the days. The end of what days? What, what testimony of Daniel was to be understood, not, I don't want to ask what testimony, all the days, at the end of the days, plural, at the end of ta Daniel's time prophecies, the 1260, the 2520, the 391, 15 day, at the end of the prophetic days, Daniel would be standing in his lot and his testimony would be fully open. Now, in 1798, there was a prophecy fulfilled. We spoke about this last night. The, what marks the time of the end for each of these histories is a fulfillment of a specific prophecy. The prophecy that was fulfilled that marked the time of the end for the Millerites was that the papacy received its d deadly wound at the end of the 1260 years. When that prophecy is fulfilled, the book of Daniel is unsealed, and there begins to be an increase of knowledge. <coughs> According to Daniel chapter 12, this in increase of knowledge is going to test that generation because in Daniel 12.10, we see that at the conclusion of this testing process, based upon the increase of knowledge that starts at the time of the end, there will be two groups. The wise will understand the increase of knowledge, but the wicked will not understand. So this, this increase of knowledge is to test this generation, but before... The Lord will hold this generation accountable for that increase of knowledge. The message has to be put into an understanding that allows the Lord to hold that generation accountable for either accepting or rejecting the message. And I mark 1833, I know that William Miller was understanding this message prior to 1833, but in Great Controversy, page 333. It says, In 1833, two years after Miller began to present his public in public the evidences of Christ's soon coming, the last of the signs appeared which were promised by the saviors as tokens of his second advent. Jesus said, The stars shall fall from heaven, Matthew 24, 29. And John in the Revelation declared as he beheld and visioned the scenes that should herald the day of God, the stars of heaven fell unto earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. By the way, Revelation 6, 13, when Sister White here is identifying the falling of the stars in Revelation 6, 13, what seal is that? No. Six seal, is it not? Okay, the, the only, this isn't this totally outside the scope of what we're presenting, but in Adventism today, we have people that are taking the, rejecting the pioneer understanding of the seals and the trumpets, and they're placing the seals at the end of the world in some kind of application that destroys the foundational understanding. And what I want you to see here is right here, Sister White is saying, the falling of the stars that are there located in the six seals, they were f it was fulfilled in 1833. It's not something that's fulfilled at the end of the world. You read it for yourself. It's right there. So we, I mark 1833 as the formalization of the message because William Miller is the messenger of that time period. It, do it doesn't seem that important to me that he received his credentials then, but that is when he received his credentials, and that's when the falling of the stars took place. And when did the falling of the stars took place? What month? Pardon me? November. November. Which means, okay, if, if it was November of 1833, what biblical year was it? 1834, biblically, right? Now, you may not understand that. You may not understand that, but it's worth, it's worth conceptualizing. Every, everyone in here knows that there was the first disappointment, right? When did the first disappointment, let me, let me say it this way, 
The first disappointment was the disappointment of 1843, was it not? Amen? When did the first disappointment arrive, set in, confront the Millerites? March of what? March of 1844. The disappointment of 1843 arrived in March of 1844. Because the, the Millerites were, were applying the time based upon the biblical reckoning of time. And the Millerites understood that the biblical year didn't begin on January 1st. It began on January 21st. And it ended on January, or not January, I'm sorry, March 21st. And it ended on March 21st. So when the Millerites were expecting the Lord to return in 1843, they believed that 1843, they be believed correctly, that 1843 continued to be 1843 until March 22nd, 1844. Okay, do you follow the logic? Do you, this is, I know this is sometimes new for some of us. Does everyone follow the logic? Okay, because I want to make a point here. The falling of the stars took place in 1833, but biblically, it was 1840, 1834. And therefore, it was 10 years before 1844. Okay? So why am I saying that? How many days before the Day of Atonement did the Feast of, or the, the, the feast of Trumpets take place? Ten days, and the, the, the trumpets were the sounding to prepare for the Day of Atonement, and ten days, ten prophetic days, ten years before the Day of Atonement, the stars fell from heaven, and the Lord gave William Miller his credentials because he was going to bring the warning message to that generation. And he, d he began to present that message, but it was not yet empowered. It was empowered when the year day principle of Bible prophecy was confirmed with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in fulfillment of. <coughs> I tried. I'm sorry. <laughs> forgive me. In fulfillment of the the time prophecy of this sixth trumpet, Revelation nine verses. 14 and 15, a time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days. The, re the, the logic of why it was empowered is the Millerites had been using the year-day principle to predict the end of the world in 1843. Okay, I probably just touched it wrong. In 1838, Josiah Litch prepared uh, an article based upon the time prophecy of Revelation 9 verses 14 and 15 predicting that in 1840 the Ottoman Empire would come to its conclusion and shortly before um, that time arrived he even updated his article to identify the very day August 11th 1840 and he was using the year day principle um, to apply the 391 year 15 day time prophecy and no one had any regard for what he was saying they did not believe it was going to happen but when it was fulfilled suddenly the message was empowered because the world could see that the year day principle that the Millerites were using was valid and at this point, the mighty angel of Revelation 10, whose sister White tells us is no less a person each than Jesus Christ, he came, came down out of heaven, and in Revelation 10, he has a book open in his hand, and that book is the book of Daniel. Sister White tells us it's the book of Daniel. All right, th th there's something, there's sev something that's, that you really, I think you should really wrap your mind around here with it being the little book of Daniel. She doesn't say that he comes down with the whole Bible open. He comes down with the little book of Daniel because it's, it's the message of Daniel that is going to test that generation. And the point is this, in each of these reform movements, the generation that's living in that time of that reform movement is tested, and it's tested by a specific prophetic message. 
Had, had he come down with the whole Bible open, then you could say, oh, they were tested by all the biblical revelation. But that generation was tested by the prophetic message in Daniel. Therefore, when this is repeated at the end of the world, our generation will be tested by a specific prophetic message. And if you don't think it's a test, you simply have to go to these reform lines. For instance, in the history of Moses, when the Lord comes down, he confronts Moses with the test of circumcision. In the history of Christ, when the dove comes down, Christ immediately goes out into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. The angel of Revelation 10 comes down and he has a little book open in his hand and in verses 8 through 10 of Revelation 10, John goes and eats the little book. And if you see what it means to eat the little book, when Ezekiel eats the little book, and when Jeremiah eats the little book, in both those passages, they are illustrating that they are given a message to take to God's people that God's people are going to be tested with. When the angel descends, it's identifying when the testing of that generation begins. And it's identifying that there's a specific prophetic message that does so. That's why the little book that's open is the book of Daniel. It's not simply the Bible. And, and that's worth taking note of because many of us in Adventism think it's optionable, op an option of ours to decide whether we consider the prophetic message or not. So, uh, in page 23, it says, Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was still sealed until the time of the end, when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to the world. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a ma glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. In 1840, the Adventist historians will tell us that the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world and that's one of the characteristics of this first way mark is that it's worldwide whether it's the first decree where Cyrus says I'm the king of all the kingdoms of all the world worldwide or whether with John the Baptist it says all of Judea and Jerusalem and all the regions round about came out to hear John the Baptist. Worldwide is one of the characteristics here. And in 1840, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. And when Sister White is commenting on Revelation 10, she says the fact that when the angel came down in Revelation 10 and put one foot upon the land and one foot upon the sea, that symbolizes a message that goes to the entire world. So when the angel in Revelation 10 came down and put one foot up on the land and one foot up on the sea, that means this is marking the worldwide message. And Sister White and the Adventist historians tell us that the first angel's message went to the whole world in 1840. So we know that the angel of Revelation 10 came down on August 11th, 1840. And the testing process of the Millerites was underway. <laughs> And you, uh, next quote, you'll see how important it is to understand 1840 correctly. Any question that Satan can arouse in the mind to create doubt in regard to the grand history of the past travels of the people of God will please his satanic majesty and is an offense to God. The tidings of the Lord soon coming in power and great glory to the, our world is truth. And in 1840, many voices were raised in its proclamation. Um, You'll see underneath this um, the passage from the Great Controversy 334 where Sister White describes Josiah Litch's work in identifying the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and in the center of the second paragraph, she says the event exactly fulfilled the prediction. And he <laughs> there, there are certain truths of Adventism that have been controversial through Adventist history, you may not be aware that this passage in the Great Controversy is one of the most argued over issues in Advent history. There's, there's actually people that teach that Uriah Smith 
snuck these two paragraphs into the great controversy without Sister White knowing it. I mean, there's, there's variations of that, but the, that, that to me seems to be the most absur absurd. Um, but this particular truth here is attacked from ma many, many different directions in Adventism. I, w I had a meeting with, uh, from what the brethren said, the, the most famous theologian in Switzerland and, um, what's the, Austria. And uh, w the meeting was in Austria. And, and he, this is the first time I heard this. I've heard this argument since more than once. <laughs> but he's saying that what Sister White is saying here is that, I don't even remember how to articulate it well. That it, it w he's, she's not saying that this prophecy was fulfilled, but that Josiah Litch's prediction was fulfilled, and it was simply a human prediction, and, and that it, this is not her confirming that this was a prophecy of the Bible that was fulfilled, but that it was strictly her saying that, well, Josiah Litch had a strange idea. He proclaimed it, and the Lord used this false information to empower the movement. I mean that all I'm saying that for is until you begin to investigate the significance of 1840 and of this event you don't realize how many crazy ideas there are in Adventism that try to destroy the understanding of 1840 and that's the one quote we look, just looked at Sister White says any anything that s Satan can do to bring doubt about 1840 it pleases Satan um, you can see under that quote from the Great Controversy, um, where the quote where Sister White says, with his one foot on the land, one foot on the sea, s signifies the wide extent of the proclamation of the world. It will cross, proclamation of the message, it will cross the broad waters and be proclaimed in other, other countries, even to the world. A similar quote underneath. Now, the second way mark in these reform movements, you see the activities of the enemies of that time period illustrated. And the arrival of the second angel took place when the Protestant churches, who were being tested, they were being tested f from 1840 onward with, with Miller's message. And in June of 1842, they began to close their doors. You can see this at the bottom of page 24. In June of 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures at the Casco Street Church in Portland, Maine. With few exceptions, the different denominations closed their doors, uh, closed the doors of their churches against Mil Mr. Miller. Now, please don't misunderstand. I am not saying that the Millerites understood that the second angel's message had arrived at that point. They didn't. I'm just marking that historically we, it has been pointed out to us that it was in June of 1842 that the Protestant churches began to close their doors on the Millerites and this is the arrival of the second angel's message Babylon has fallen. It's not till later on in this history that the Millerites recognize that the second angel's message has been has arrived and then you know what the problem was? As they sat around, they realized the second angel's message has arrived and that the Protestant churches have become Babylon. They've fallen. And therefore, the logic is, is we have to begin to call people out of those of our former churches. Now we have to go to back to our Methodist church and say, brothers and sisters, you need to flee the Methodist church. And they didn't want to do it. They didn't have the willingness to go say Babylon has fallen, come out of the churches. And then one of them, wrote an article? It, it was Fitch. I always say Bates. Fitch wrote an article where he, he identified th this whole understanding and from that point on the floodgates were open and they began to call people out of Babylon. But the doors, the arrival of the second angel's message took, here, took place here even if they didn't understand it until 1844. wrote the article in 43 and uh, it didn't gain much notice by the leaders, Himes, Miller and the rest. It was noted 
it had, it was it wasn't rejected, but it, it didn't gain much steam until uh, August of '44. Okay. Now we mentioned we've used as one of our proof texts here that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter that Great Controversy 393 where Sister White says the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. And then we put with that, and it's in your notes, Review and Herald August 19th, 1890 where Sister White says I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter in the Millerite history, but it's fulfilled again to the very letter in the history of the 144,000. This is another support for the fact that the seven thunders represents both those histories also. But here in the next quote, we know that um, they were predicting the end of the world in 1843, and that time passed, the first disappointment, and the, the tearing time um, began for the Millerites in fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. And Sister White touches on this a little bit in this next quote from Great Controversy 392, um, top of page 25 of your notes. And please notice, notice this. This is, we're going to try to make some points here. As early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now, uh, turn with me, if you would, to Habakkuk. Maybe, maybe I have it in your notes. Okay, I, I just turn over to the next page of your notes, top of page 26. It's this passage in Habakkuk that was recognized by the Millerites that Sister White is commenting on here. Habakkuk 2 verse 1 says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Based upon that passage in scripture, the Millerites in 1842 produced the 1843 chart. It's called the 1843 chart because it is predicting the end of the world in 1843. So they were d specifically guided by this passage in the scriptures to make that chart. And Sister White is, is speaking about that. If you turn back to the previous page, I'll continue reading. As early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it had suggested to Sar Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and Revelation. The publication of this chart was now notice, was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. The Millerites believed that they had been directed by the Lord to produce this chart. No one, however, then noticed that an apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision, a tarrying time, is presented in the same prophecy. If you go back to the next page where we have the passage in Habakkuk, where I left off, it says, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now the, the point is this, they seen this passage in Habakkuk and were convicted that they needed to produce, produce that chart. And when the first disappointment arrived in 1844, the first disappointment of 1843, and they lost their zeal when they realized the end of the world didn't come, it was that very same passage of scripture that revive their faith when they read it again and it says the vision it might look like it tarries but it doesn't tarry it's going to come so the Lord was using this passage in Habakkuk in a specific way to guide his people and the Millerites understood that the production of that chart was one of the sacred waymarks of that history so I'm going to put right here because of room one of the waymarks of the Millerite history is the 1843 chart. Okay, and um, notice on the bottom of page 25 a statement of James White. It says, it was the united testimony of Second Advent 
lectures and papers when standing on the original faith that the publication of the chart was a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2 verses 2 and 3 if the chart was a subject of prophecy and those who deny it leave the original faith. James White was so convicted that that chart was a subject of prophecy, that it was a way mark of that history, that he said, if you deny that this chart is part of this history, you leave the original Advent faith. And he's, he's, a, he's representing the understanding of all of them. This chart is part of this history. Okay, you can't separate it. It's, it's there. Now, um, Sister White, in the center of page 26, you got the comment from Sister White from early writings that we're probably familiar with. She says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. Now, it is altered. Because after 1844, the Lord tells Sister White to have her husband produce a new chart, which is the chart on the right side where they're no longer predicting the end of the world in 1843 and they also add uh, the three angels messages in the sanctuary that aren't isn't illustrated on this chart but she says I was shown that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered but if you go back to the the original statement where she says that that they took the statement and put it into early writings they edited it a little bit and in the original statement she says I so I was shown that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and then it should not be altered except at inspired direction it's in a statement like that and that's what happened the Lord used Ellen White to say okay go ahead and correct that chart and they produced the 1850 chart under the direction of the Lord and I th think I don't have the quotes here on the 1850 chart it's in the notes but not here right in front of us sister white says the 18 of the 1850 chart she says I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by brother Nichols I saw that there's a prophecy of the Bible uh, in the Bible of this chart and if this chart was good enough for one it's good enough for everyone paraphrase but the divine endorsement is on both those charts. All right. Um, so we're dealing with just laying out the waymarks of Millerite history. And on page 26, we've looked at Habakkuk a little bit. I want to finish off Habakkuk on the top of the page. It says, "For the vision is yet for the appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for a, for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry." Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Um, you'll notice Ezekiel 12, 22 and 28, which Sister White also identifies was the, another passage in scripture that led to the production of the 1843 chart. And then you'll see a comment by Joseph Bates um, uh, in the center of page 26. And Joseph Bates is telling us, um, he's putting his endorsement upon what we've just told you about the 1843 chart. And he tells us um, on the bottom paragraph of his statement, after some discussion on the subject, it was voted unanimously to have 300 similar to this one lithograph, which was soon accomplished. They were called the 43 chart. This was a very important conference and the historians tell us that there was roughly 300 Millerite preachers and all of them used this chart exclusively. Um, and you notice the quote underneath it from Joseph Bates, our history shows that there were hundreds teaching from the same chronology charts, chronological charts that William Miller was, all of one stamp. What's it mean all of one stamp? unified on the very same message, that message of that chart, then it was that the oneness of the message all on one theme, the coming of the Lord at a certain time, 1844. The next quote from Selected Messages, um, she says the first and second angels messages were given in 1843 and 1844. Uh, we've already made the point there. The second angels message arrives in history. Uh, the Millerites don't understand that initially, so it's not till um, 
44, as, as Dwayne's pointed out, that they begin to actually proclaim the second angel's message. Notice that the message of Miller goes through history, and then it's empowered. Also, with the second angel's message, it goes through history, and then it's empowered at the midnight cry, which is the same with the third message. Third message arrives in 1844, October 22nd, and we know it goes through history until at some point at the end of the world when the fourth angel joins it and it is empowered. All the messages go through history, then they're empowered. Go through history, then they're empowered. Um, notice the first angel's message is carried to the entire world. But on page 27 of your notes in the Great Controversy 389, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844 and it then had a more direct application to the churches of the United States. This message, the, the characteristic of this message is the United States, worldwide local. And in these reform lines, you can demonstrate this characteristic. This, this characteristic you will see worldwide emphasized, this local. First angel's message is fulfilled, er, it has a component of worldwide, second in the United States, when the Protestants close their doors against the message. That's important to note. Then underneath that from the Great Controversy 398, the midnight cry arrives at the Exeter camp meeting um, from August 12th through 17th, 1844. And empowered by that message, it's carried across the United States like a tidal wave, Sister White says. And from leaving that meeting, that camp meeting on the 17th of August until October 22nd, the Millerite message is carried all across the United States at a time period when there is no airplanes, there is no email, there is no radio, there is no television. And it was a, a mighty manifestation of the power of God. This is, this is illustrated at this point in these reform movements. This was not a human work. This was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can see the quote where Sister White says it was like a tidal wave. And in the same quote, Great Controversy 400, she also tells us that it was like all the other revivals of biblical history because she's ar we've already dealt with the principle that the um, reform movements all parallel one another. Now, I didn't quite note when I started. Okay, so here's what, I, here's what I want to suggest. The reason that I was looking more specific at the Millerite history here is because we've been identifying that this history is repeated at the end of the world. We're, we're identif trying to identify for us here that the time of the end at the end of the world is 1989. Because the time of the end in every reform movement is marked by a fulfillment of a prophecy. And Daniel 11 verse 40, as we discussed last night, identifies the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. But in so doing, it's identifying that the sequen of a sequence of events that are illustrated in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, that they are now underway. Verse 40 is fulfilled. And the sequence of events in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, lead right into Daniel 12, 1, which is the close of human probation when Michael stands up. And Sister White tells us, the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble have been clearly revealed. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important events than if they have never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every... Satan watches to catch away every impression, this quote's on page 21 of your notes, that would make them wise unto salvation. So when Sister White's talking about the events connected with the close of probation that are clearly revealed that most of us don't know, she says that Satan is watching that we don't become familiar with these events because if we do, we'll be made wise unto salvation. In other words, the understanding of this sequence of events is salvational. But very few know what these events are. But what we're saying is 
is that in every one of these reform movements there is a prophecy that is fulfilled and when it is fulfilled it sheds light upon this coming generation and sure enough with the fulfillment of Daniel 11 verse 40 in 1989 it tells the student of prophecy the next thing to happen after verse 40 is verse 41 and Daniel 11 verse 41 is identifying a Sunday law in the United States. Verse 42 and 43 is telling when the papacy's deadly wound is fully healed and it takes control of the whole world. And the message for this generation is the third angel's message, which is a warning about receiving the mark of the beast. And it's the history of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the events connected with the close of probation that tell the student of prophecy in Adventism that the time period when the papacy is about to return to the throne of the earth is underway and in 1989 in 1989 the time of the end arrived for Adventism and of course we're, we're making a case here this weekend that on 9-11 2001 the angel of Revelation 18 came down in an event in a an event that was recognized throughout the world was not September 11th a worldwide event okay because this way mark is always a worldwide event and we're saying that in the history of verse 40 which includes the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 but it continues until the Sunday law in verse 41 that the angel comes down and in port powers this message that has been opened up here and when verse 41 of Daniel 11 arrives you have the Sunday law in the United States when the Protestants of the United States close their door against the message paralleling when the Protestants of the United States close their door against Miller's message and at that point the loud cry is underway in its fullness paralleling the midnight cry here and here when the third angel's message arrived on October 22nd 1844 judgment because judgment is always the characteristic of this way mark judgment begin and the loud cry continues until Michael stands up in Daniel 12 1 and judgment closes now I there's more to say about this we're going to deal with this I wanted to put this up here for to make one point we're saying that <coughs> and if you were here last night you will have already heard some of the logic that in this history of every reform movement the foundations are laid and that Miller was the man that the Lord used to raise the foundational understandings of Millerite history. And in this history right here, the, the parallel history, the foundation that the 144,000 will have to establish is the truth in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that the 144,000 have to return to the foundations and walk in the old past. Jeremiah 6:16, 6, uh, Isaiah 58:12. The work of the 144,000 into returning to the foundational truths is their foundational work and we're saying that since 2001 the Lord is open, uh, opening up and establishing the fact that God's people have to go back to the foundations but as Jeremiah says when we return to the old past there's a group in Adventism that says we will not walk therein and verse 17 says that the Lord raises up watchmen at that time that says hearken to the sound of the trumpet and they said we will not hearken and of course the trumpet we're suggesting is the seventh trumpet but it wasn't the seventh trumpet what they were to hearken to the trumpet they were to hearken to in the Millerite time period was the sixth trumpet the sixth trumpet with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire is what brought the angel down in Millerite history it's the seventh trumpet in our history the third world that brings the angel down parallel histories but and here's where I would like to close all right we're also saying that in this history if it's a parallel history that it's at this point 
that the 1843 chart would once again become present truth. And brothers and sisters, there is a revival in looking into this chart going on around planet Earth today that is unbelievable and it has taken hold right here, right after 9-11. Now it's different. The Millerites were using that chart to reach out. God is now using that chart to reach in, to lead his back people back to the foundations. Now turn with me, if you would, where we started the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and it seemed like I had a consensus here at the beginning that in verse 19 of Hebrews 10 it says having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus it seems that I had a consensus that this was entering into the most holy place in other words this is a passage in Hebrews that's not dealing with Millerite history when, when they're in the holy place time period. This is dealing with our history in the most holy place time period, right? So, <coughs> 1019, sorry, Hebrews. Who's going to make a comment? No, I, I, and I, I started with an, uh, were you here at the very beginning? I started with an argument where in the study Bible they have a comment by Sister White where she's making the application that, um, that allows us to recognize this is holy place, most holy place time period if we wish. That's why I raised the question to make sure we were on this page. Um, but I want to show you something here. Um, If Hebrews 10, 19 and onward is our history, not Millerite history, if it's the history of most holy place time period, okay? Notice um, verse 35 of Hebrews 10. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry does that sound familiar now the just shall live by his faith by faith but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him this is Habakkuk this is an application of Habakkuk not in the Millerite time period, but in our time period. Now, if you move forward in your notes, I'm almost done here, to page 38. You will see the opening of the first chapter of Testimonies, Volume 9. And where does the first chapter of Testimonies, Volume 9, begin. Oh, uh, this, I should say this, right? <laughs> Begins on page 11. This is 9-11. And what is the first thing that is in Testimonies 9-11? It says, For the coming of the King, yet a little while, and he that shall com will come will not tarry. Hebrews 10-37. The last crisis. We are now living in the time of the end. Sister White is identifying, associating this last crisis with the very passage in Scripture that endorses the production of this chart. And when you look at the reason we're not here yet, when you look at chapter or this chapter in its fullness, it's describing the history that begins in 1989 at the time of the end and opens up for the 144,000. Sequentially. Sequentially. And you have the entire chapter there if you want to read it in between. But there's one thing to note. If you want to know where we're at in that history now, there's a paragraph in there a little bit further on where it says, the leaders of the United States 
are struggling in vain to put business operations on a more secure basis. Brothers and sisters, we're here. And what they're doing is not going to work. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us together upon this mountaintop on this Sabbath day and we ask that your Holy Spirit and, and angels will continue to abide with us throughout this day. We ask that as we're considering these truths that you're unfolding to us that you would give us wisdom and discernment to recognize them and recognize what purpose you intend for them. We wish you would, we give you permission and hope that you will take these truths and confront us individually um, with the areas in our life that we need to overcome, set aside and change that we might be molded and fashioned according to the pattern that you've given us in the example of your life. We want to be among those that perfectly reflect your character, but we understand that we're Laodiceans and that we need to be awakened and transformed into your image. We give you permission to do what it takes with the material you're opening up for us that that can be accomplished. Please be with us throughout the rest of this day and continue um, to bless us um, with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The, if you, for those of you who have come, the rule that they've set up... Yeah, just a reminder. ...is uh, write your questions down and, and then afterwards we'll answer the questions... Uh, so, so now we're going to open up for questions uh, for anybody that has them. And uh, before you make the question, just let me know so that you can get the microphone. And if there isn't any questions, we'll take a break. There's a question. Brother Jeff, uh, regarding the beginning of the presentation when you did the comment about the formalization of the message in 1833, uh, with the first disappointment, which was 10 years later. Uh, but I just wanted to say, what is the significance of that? And as well, the disappointment was in 1844, in, in, in October. So wh what is the relationship? Okay, I think uh, I may have got you mixed up on something. Here's, here's what I'm saying. William Miller is the man the Lord used to formalize the message, to put it into an understanding that could test that generation. But... Like, as Sister White says, two years before 1833, Miller's already preaching his message. So when I select, as a human being, I select 1833 and say, I'm putting 1833 as the date that Miller formalized the message, you could say, hey, well, he was preaching the message in 1831, why are you picking 1833? So what I'm doing, I'm saying, he, the, my logic, I don't care, I won't argue over this one. You can place... I'll argue that it was Miller that formalized the message, but I won't argue about the, uh, the actual date that we should put on that prophetically. But the reason that I put 1833 is because Sister White comments that he received his credentials, but he received his credentials at the very time that the falling of the stars took place. But it took place in November of 1833, which means that biblically, it actually took place biblically in 1844. Yeah, the falling of the stars. 1834. 1834. 34. 34. Uh, the point being is, it, it therefore, it took place 10 years before 1844. So as a, now you're at a place, once you see that, where you can make one more argument. Because 1844 is the arrival of the Day of Atonement, but the Day of Atonement is preceded by uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets 10 days before. So w using the year day principle, understanding that 1833 is actually 1834, then the falling of the stars is marking the, the Feast of Trumpets 10 years before 1844, a day for a year. Would 1844 be really biblical 1845? I mean, if we're saying that 1833 uh, no, 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 is biblical 1834, one, one of the I'll explain that to you. One of the one of the terms that if you if you could resurrect the Millerites, and you ask them, what's the seventh month movement? Uh, 
Everyone, every Millerite would tell you exactly what the seventh month movement was. But if you would resurrect us in this room and say, what's the seventh month movement? Very few of us are going to be able to explain what the seventh month movement is. But, I but the seventh month movement, and I am answering your question even if you're not following me at first. The be year began on March 22nd. Okay, because they understood the biblical year ended on March 21st. Oh, Jewish, sacred. Jewish sacred, sacred year. So it begins on March 22nd. Then April, May, June, July, August, September, October. October 22nd is the seventh month of this year. That's why it's the seventh month movement. This movement from the first disappointment until October 22nd, this is where all the, the, the action took place. But no, October 22nd, 1844 is still in 1844. It's the seventh month of 1844. Because 1844 does not end until March 21st of 1845. It, and it takes a, it takes a while, uh, for, at least it took a while for me, it probably take less time for you for this to click, but when it clicks... <laughs> well, let's put it this way. March 22nd of 1843 would be what? 1833. But uh, March 22nd of 1833 is is the first day of 1844, right? Right? So March 22nd of 1833 is the first day of what? 1834. So if March 22nd is the first day uh, March 22nd, 1833 is the first day of 1834. What is November of 1833? It's the eighth month of 1834. Okay? <laughs> and it, b b it, you may think, okay, uh, I kind of get it, uh, so what, uh, this isn't important. But really, once you finally get this in your mind, it's helpful. It's helpful. And then you realize it's not really that hard. Although the first time you're confronted with it, you think, why is this important for him to even bring up and is, does it really fit? Can I make a quick comment? I wanted to make a, a comment on 1833 and William Miller when he was um, giving his credential. In the book of a Progress and Advance of Adventism pointed out that when the falling of the star had occurred, <laughs> that empowered William Message and he had received so many calls that he couldn't keep up with all the meeting requests that he had had after the falling of the star. So that was kind of an empowerment movement or point for William Miller and his message that he was carrying. One of the Go ahead, Dwayne. One of the things you might want to, what he's telling you about the Jewish, Jewish sacred year is on that chart, the 1843 chart on the left, when they're showing you 1843 at the bottom of that chart, they're not talking about the Gregorian calendar year, they're talking about the Jewish sacred year. So you're not looking at the, uh, I'm sorry, Julian calendar year, 1843. He's talking about the Jewish sacred year at the bottom of that chart. It's not the civil calendar that we go by. Right there is Jewish time, not civil time. The it's Paul, isn't it? Yes. Brother Paul. You said that the um, ten, the the parable of the ten. Virgins. Virgins reflected the Adventist experience. And you quoted a uh, Ellen White. Um, uh, Great Controversy 393. That she said that it has been and will be oh. fulfilled to the very letter. So doesn't that mean 
that the experience of the falling stars is going to happen again? Oh, we, there's a statement I think we'll get to when we deal with Luke 21 where she says, speaking of the falling of the stars as one of the signs that's mentioned in Luke 21, she says, these signs have been fulfilled. Um, now, I'm not, I still am not unwilling to um, identify that there's a manifestation in the heavens that takes place at the end of the, end, of the end of the world. But in terms of the dark day, the falling of the stars, the great earthquake, those fulfillments were the signs connected with the Millerite history. Whereas in, in Luke 21, Jesus sets forth the sign for our history and he tells us that the signs, the sign for us is not the, the, the earthquake and the falling of the stars. He, the sign for us is the budding trees of spring and we're going to deal with that. Um, it, which is part of Luke 21 also. So I'm not necessarily arguing that there is no falling of the stars that takes place at the end of the world because I know those other passages. But in terms of these, those prophecies, that preceded and ushered in the Millerite movement, the dark day, the earthquake, the falling of the stars, inspiration has specifically located them as the signs for the Millerite history. And, and, and when I'm saying that, I want you to, if you, I haven't taken any time to it, each of these reform movements have their own specific signs connected with them. The Bible talks about the signs and wonders that took place in Egypt in the time period of Moses. Um, there were signs in the time period of Christ. There were signs for uh, the time period of the Millerites. And, and most Adventists knows, know at least one sign for Adventism. The Sunday Law is a sign for Adventists to what? To leave the city. So we, we, there are certain signs for each of these generations. And inspiration has marked the earthquake, the dark day, the falling of the stars. It's Millerite signs, but the Lord's still going to shake the heavens and the earth. One of the things that will help understand about the uh, parable of the ten virgins, in Millerite history there were... Uh, in Millerite history there are uh, two midnight cries. There was an original midnight cry that they uh, took from the parable of uh, Matthew 25 that was uh, dated from 1831 to about uh, August the... 12th of 1844. And at Exeter uh, camp meeting in August the 12th of 1844, it was at that camp meeting that they understood that they had entered into the unreal understanding of the parable of the ten virgins. So mark it down in your notes that when she makes the comment that the parable of the ten virgins will repeat it to the very letter, she's taking you to the history of October the, uh, August the 12th through October 22nd, 1844, when the wise and the foolish virgins were made up. I, I would add something to that too. When we're talking about the seventh month movement and all the details of that history and saying that we should understand that that year began on March 22nd, seventh mo seven months later, biblical months, you're at October 22nd, and understand the significance of that history. Remember a vision of Sister White where she sees God's people on a path to heaven and she says there's a bright light set up behind them that casts light all along the way and then she tells us what that bright light was. What was it? The midnight cry. You cannot understand the midnight cry here. You can't understand it as you should understand it unless you understand the seventh month movement and according to Sister White those that stay on the path and get to heaven, they're going to have to be f following the light. Now there's light in front of them too, but th the light behind them is what's illuminating their path as well. So we need to understand that light. We need to understand it. In fact, we know mo um, more often than not, we know that William Miller didn't accept the Sabbath. All right. What we don't understand is the first mistake William Miller made is after 1844, prior to 1844, he had accepted that the midnight cry was of the Lord. Okay? But after 1844, he decided, nope, that wasn't of the Lord, and he reverted to the first midnight cry that Duane was talking back. He went back here. The first mistake that William Miller made is he denied the midnight cry and then he refused the Sabbath. 
And Adventists at the end of the world, the first thing they do is they reject the history of the midnight cry, the Millerite history, the foundational history, and this prepares them to accept Sunday, just like William Miller. The difference is, we know that angels are waiting by William Miller's grave, and he's a saved man, but those Seventh-day Adventists now that receive the mark of the beast, that is not the promise. Yeah, those, those that... Yeah. That's right. Yeah, those that reject the, the midnight cry fall into the wicked world. It, yes, into the darkness <laughs> below. understand what he meant? <laughs> well, I mean, I, uh, if the first time you're confronted with this material, there's no way I think humanly that you're going to understand what the footprint of Daniel 9 is in relation to the midnight cry, but it's nice to hear it because it's a challenge to go figure it out. <laughs> Put the backbone in there and the, and the faith. Daniel 9 was the actually the foundational text that led them to understand the chronology that led to the information on that chart and on that chart and it's the foundation on which the midnight cry is, is built and when in Albany in 1845 of April of that year when Himes and, and Litch, Fitch is dead but when all the major uh, Millerite leaders uh, denied the validity of the true midnight cry based upon the chronology of Daniel 9 they went into darkness Daniel 9 was the key text that allowed those who went in with Christ by faith into the most holy place they knew that that chronology was biblical and it was sound we're probably getting giving you information overload so I'm going to give you one I'm going to give you a little bit more overload and then he's going to hand it to you but I want to say one thing Samuel Snow is the one that brought the message to this camp meeting in August 12th through 17th. And the message he brought was a message based upon the chronology of Daniel chapter 9 that allowed him to reach out into other passages of the Bible as well and identify that it was in the seventh month that the Day of Atonement arrives and therefore they could not only calculate the year 1842 but they could calculate October 22nd, 18, I mean 44, I said 42. They could calculate the very day of 1844. Snow's calculation based upon Daniel 9 where they nailed down October 22nd, 1844 is the the message of the midnight cry that made them realize October 22nd, 1844 this is the message and they took it to the world. After that is when people began saying no you know this doesn't fit and if you if you throw away Daniel chapter 9 you can't, <laughs> the cr chronology of it, you can't establish October 22nd, 1844. Yeah, the chronology of Daniel 9 begins with 457 B.C. at the com command of Artaxerxes and closes on October 22nd, 1844. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, we, we read a quote today and it um, reminded me of a quote that we read yesterday that... Uh, I, w I had questions on and I wanted you to help me clarify because I'm, I'm having a doubt about my understanding and maybe you can clarify my understanding of it. In page 25 where it says the 1843 chart, this is from early writing 74 and 75, and it ends by saying time has not been a test since 1844 and it will never again be a test. And if you go back to page 12, and this is from SDA Bible Commentary, volume 7971, and it says at the uh, first paragraph, towards the end of the first paragraph, that is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this time period, period of time reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. I was just wondering, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm applying this wrong, but, you know, this 
tracing that we're doing of the history of the 144,000 placing way marks in time, is that, is that not tracing a prophetic time after 1844? Uh, yeah, I, uh, grammatically, I guess you could make that case, but that is definitely not I, what she's saying. She's I, saying I know we're not placing like dates and saying, well, this... But she, uh, what, no, what she's saying is there's no more prophecies that have the element of predictive time connected with them. We're, when, when, I, when I say that the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989 in fulfillment of Daniel 1140, that's looking back to that event and saying that event fulfilled this prophecy. Um, you're not gonna, you don't find any, anyone in Adventism that, that I, well you find one guy, but he wasn't placing the date. You find Louis Weir, an Adventist pastor in the 1950s, taking Daniel 1140, and he says in the very near future, the Soviet Union is going to be brought down through an alliance between the papacy and the Protestant powers. But he did not say, and this will occur in 1989. When, when the understanding of this fulfillment of this verse took place, it took place on this side, and you mark when it happened, but there was no... There was no, at this point, there was no prediction saying, okay, on September 11, 2001, uh, the Twin Towers in New York City are going to come down. It's after that time, you look back and say, okay, this is a, this the arrival of the seventh trumpet, the, or the, the third woe. Whereas what she's speaking about is, is they were being tested by time. They were being tested by these time prophecies that they were dealing with, where they were predicting events in the future based upon prophetic time. And at, in 1844, prophetic time ends. There's never going to be a test for the people of God that says, as there is, as people try to teach in Adventism today, there's teachers in Adventism today that say, when the Sunday law arrives in the United States, 1260 days later, you'll have the world Sunday law, and then 30 days after that, the 1290, Michael stands up and human probation closes. And 1,330 day, five days after that Sunday law, you have the, the blessing of Christ announcing his day and hour. There are people that are doing that. And Sister White says, that'll never, we'll never have another message that's hung on time, she says one time. But prophecy is... It's when we started, we gave you a definition of prophecy. Historical events were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. If you're going to illustrate prophecy as being confirmed, you have to point to historical events. And so this historical event, the collapse of the Soviet Union, some people will argue that politically you can say, well, the Soviet Union really didn't collapse till 1991. Yeah, basically, it, it's, it's, there was no predictive element saying that in 1989 it's going to fall. 1991 it's going to fall. It was 1989. Well, we better, we better cut it off because it's... Um <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. The, the scriptures describe the papacy as coming from the bottomless pit. And the atheistic power is also described as coming from the bottomless pit. And at the time of the end in 1798, the papacy received her deadly wound. And in 1989, or you can say 1991, we can, in those years, we have the atheistic power also uh, coming from the bottomless pit. Uh, coming down. Coming down. So we have both issues of two entities coming from the bottomless pit described in the scriptures coming uh, to the close at the time of their end. And actually, I've, s I've seen an article um, in print that uh, people of the world say that the Soviet Union fell in 1989. Yeah. So yeah th it, there's, so a, there's a few people that say 1991 for certain reasons, but the, the mo most of the historians point to, point to 1989. Yeah. At a prophetic level, All right. at a prophetic level, there's another argument and that's in 1989 you have the bringing down of the Berlin Wall that's Daniel 11 verse 4 and 1989 historically forever the Berlin Wall the USSR no longer exists whatever the Soviet Union did so it is 1989 even if someone wants to play political games with 91 they're wrong <laughs> yeah, w yeah well the, but, but at a prophetic level and I, I may cause some of you to stumble you know the, the people right now that are trying to bring in the one world government the globalists if you go read the globalist literature, they will tell you that in order to bring in a one world government, 
you have to remove the national sovereignty of every country. Every country has got to surrender its national sovereignty in order for, to bring in a one world government. And when they discuss this issue, they talk about the wall of national sovereignty being taken away from every country. That's, that's their metaphorical way of expressing it. So when you look at Daniel 11, 40, 41, and 42, you see the papacy conquering the king of the south in 1989 when the the Iron Curtain is brought down and the Berlin Wall comes down. But when it conquers the glorious land, the United States, in verse 41, the wall of separation of church and state is removed. And when it conquers Egypt, in verse 42, the wall of national sovereignty comes down. But the wall that came down in 1989, the Berlin Wall, at a prophetic level, you can, <laughs> you can do 1989. Okay, so let's... Um uh, we should start our next meeting right now, but what we're going to do is everybody go out, get some, get the blood going, get some fresh air, and then, yeah, so we'll be back in 15 minutes. Is that okay? All right, so 15 minutes, we'll be back.